The Roman poet Ovid gives us a connected narrative of creation. Before the earth and sea and the all-covering heaven, one aspect, which we call chaos, covered all the face of nature. A rough heap of inert weight and discordant beginnings of things clashing together. As yet, no sun gave light to the world nor did the moon renew her slender horn month by month. Neither did the earth hang in the surrounding air, poised by its own weight, nor did the sea stretch its long arms around the earth. Wherever there was earth, there was also sea and air. So the earth was not solid, nor was the water fluid, neither was the air transparent. God and nature at last interposed and put an end to this discord, separating earth from sea and heaven from both. The fiery part, being the lightest, sprang up and formed the skies. The air was next in weight and place. The earth, being heavier, sank below, and the water took the lowest place and buoyed up the earth. Here some god, no man knows who, arranged and divided the land. He placed the rivers and bays, raised mountains and dug out valleys, and distributed woods, fountains, fertile fields, and stony plains. Now that the air was clear, the stars shone out. The fishes swam the sea, and birds flew in the air, while the four-footed beasts roamed around the earth. But a nobler animal was needed, and man was made in the image of the gods, with an upright stature, so that while all other animals turn their faces downward and look to the earth, he raises his face to heaven and gazes on the stars. To Prometheus the Titan, and to his brother Epimetheus, was committed the task of making man and all other animals, and of endowing them with all needful faculties. This Epimetheus did, and his brother overlooked the work. Epimetheus then gave to the different animals their several gifts of courage, strength, swiftness, and sagacity. He gave wings to one, claws to another, a shelly covering to the third. Man, superior to all other animals, came last. But for man, Epimetheus had nothing. He had bestowed all his gifts elsewhere. He came to his brother for help, and Prometheus, with the aid of Minerva, went up to heaven, lighted his torch at the chariot of the sun, and brought down fire to man. With this, man was more than equal to all other animals. Fire enabled him to make weapons to subdue wild beasts, tools with which to till the earth. With fire, he warmed his dwelling and bid defiance to the cold. Woman was not yet made. The story is that Jupiter made her and sent her to Prometheus and his brother to punish them for their presumption in stealing fire from heaven and man for accepting the gift. The first woman was named Pandora. She was made in heaven every god contributing something to perfect her. Venus gave her beauty, Mercury persuasion, Apollo music. Thus equipped, she was conveyed to earth and presented to Epimetheus, who gladly accepted her, though cautioned by his brother to beware of Jupiter and his gifts. Epimetheus had in his house a jar, in which were kept certain noxious articles, for which, in fitting man for his new abode, he had had no occasion. Pandora was seized with an eager curiosity to know what this jar contained, and one day she slipped off the cover and looked in. Forthwith there escaped a multitude of plagues for hapless man, such as gout, rheumatism, and colic for his body and envy, spite, and revenge for his mind, and scattered themselves far and wide. Pandora hastened to replace the lid, but alas, the whole contents of the jar had escaped, one thing only excepted, which lay at the bottom, and that was hope. 
So we see it this day. Whatever evils are abroad, hope never entirely leaves us. And while we have that, no amount of other ills can make us completely wretched. Another story is that Pandora was sent in good faith by Jupiter to bless man, that she was furnished with a box containing her marriage presents, into which every god had put some blessing. She opened the box incautiously, and the blessings all escaped, hope only accepted. This story seems more consistent than the former, for how could hope, so precious a jewel as it is, have been kept in a jar full of all manner of evils. The world being thus furnished with inhabitants, the first age was an age of innocence and happiness, called the Golden Age. Truth and right prevailed, though not enforced by law, nor was there any magistrate to threaten or punish. The forest had not yet been robbed of its trees to furnish timbers for vessels, nor had men built fortifications round their towns. There were no such things as swords, spears, or helmets. The earth brought forth all things necessary for man, without his labor in plowing or sowing. Perpetual spring reigned. Flowers sprang up without seed. The rivers flowed with milk and wine, and yellow honey distilled from the oaks. But when good Saturn, banished from above, was driven to hell, the world was under Jove. Succeeding times a silver age behold, excelling brass, but more excelled by gold. Then summer, autumn, winter did appear, and spring was but a season of the year. The sun his annual course obliquely made, Good days contracted and enlarged the bad. Then air with sultry heats began to glow. The wings of wind were clogged with ice and snow. And shivering mortals into houses driven sought shelter from the inclemency of heaven. Those houses then were caves or homely sheds with twining osiers fenced and moss their beds. Then plows for seed the fruitful furrows broke, and oxen labored first beneath the yoke. To this came next in course the brazen age, a warlike offspring prompt to bloody rage, not impious yet. Hard steel succeeded then, and stubborn as the metal were the men. Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book One, Dryden's Translation. Crime burst in like a flood. Modesty, truth, and honor fled. In their places came fraud and cunning, violence, and the wicked love of gain. Then seamen spread sails to the wind, and the trees were torn from the mountains to serve for keels to ships and vex the face of ocean. The earth, which till now had been cultivated in common, began to be divided off into possessions. Men were not satisfied with what the surface produced, but must dig into its bowels, and draw forth from thence the ores of metals. Mischievous iron and more mischievous gold were produced. War sprang up, using both as weapons, the guest was not safe in his friend's house, and sons-in-law and fathers-in-law, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, could not trust one another. Sons wished their fathers dead that they might come to the inheritance. Family love lay prostrate. The earth was wet with slaughter, and the gods abandoned it one by one, till Astraea alone was left and finally she also took her departure. Jupiter, seeing the state of things, burned with anger. He summoned the gods to council. They obeyed the call and took the road to the palace of heaven. The road, which anyone may see in a clear night, stretches across the face of the sky and is called the Milky Way. 
Along the road stand the palaces of the illustrious gods. The common people of the skies live apart on either side. Jupiter addressed the assembly. He set forth the frightful condition of things on the earth, and closed by announcing his intention to destroy the whole of its inhabitants and provide a new race, unlike the first, who would be more worthy of life and much better worshippers of the gods. So saying, he took a thunderbolt and was about to launch it at the world and destroy it by burning it. But recollecting the danger that such a conflagration might set heaven itself on fire, he changed his plan and resolved to drown the world. Aquila, the north wind, which scatters the clouds, was chained up. Notice the south was sent out and soon covered all the face of heaven with a cloak of pitchy darkness. The clouds, driven together, resound with a crash. Torrents of rain fall. The crops are laid low. The year's labor of the husbandman perishes in an hour. Jupiter, not satisfied with his own waters, calls on his brother Neptune to aid him with his. He lets loose the rivers and pours them over the land. At the same time, he heaves the land with an earthquake and brings in the reflux of the ocean over the shores. Flocks, herds, men, and houses are swept away, and temples with their sacred enclosures profaned. If any edifice remained standing, it was overwhelmed and its turrets lay hid beneath the waves. Now all was sea, sea without shore. Here and there someone remained on a projecting hilltop, and a few in boats pulled the oar where they had lately driven the plow. The fishes swim among the treetops. The anchor is let down into a garden where the graceful lambs played, but now unwieldy sea calves gamble. The wolf swims among the sheep. The yellow lions and tigers struggle in the water. The strength of the wild boar serves him not, nor his swiftness the stag. The birds fall with weary wing into the water, having found no land for a resting place. Those living beings whom the water spared fell a prey to hunger. Parnassus alone of all the mountains overtopped the waves, and there Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha of the race of Prometheus found refuge, he a just man and she a faithful worshipper of the gods. Jupiter, when he saw none left alive but this pair, and remembered their harmless lives and pious demeanor, ordered the north winds to drive away the clouds and disclose the skies to earth and earth to the skies. Neptune also directed Triton to blow on his shell and sound a retreat to the waters. The waters obeyed, and the sea returned to its shores and the rivers to their channels. Then Deucalion thus addressed Pyrrha, O oh, wife, only surviving woman, joined to me first by the ties of kindred and marriage, and now by a common danger. Would that we possessed the power of our ancestor Prometheus, and could renew the race as he first made it. But as we cannot, let us seek yonder temple, and inquire of the gods what remains for us to do. They entered the temple, deformed as it was with slime, and approached the altar, where no fire burned. There they fell prostrate on the earth, and prayed the goddess to inform them how they might retrieve their miserable affairs. The oracle answered, Depart from the temple with head veiled and garments unbound, and cast behind you the bones of your mother. They heard the words with astonishment. Pyrrha first broke silence. We cannot obey. We dare not profane the remains of our parents. They sought the thickest shades of the wood, and revolved the oracle in their minds. At length Deucalion spoke. Either my sagacity deceives me, 
or the command is one we may obey without impiety. The earth is the great parent of all. The stones are her bones. These we may cast behind us, and I think this is what the oracle means. At least it will do no harm to try. They veiled their faces, unbound their garments, and picked up stones and cast them behind them. The stones, wonderful to relate, began to grow soft and assume shape. By degrees they put on a rude resemblance to the human form, like a block half finished in the hands of the sculptor. The moisture and slime that were about them became flesh, the stony part became bones, the veins remained veins, retaining their name only changing their use. Those thrown by the hand of the man became men, and those by the woman became women. It was a hard race, and well adapted to labor, as we find ourselves to be at this day, giving plain indications of our origin. Thank you so much for watching, folks. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button, and consider subscribing for more videos like this one every Wednesday.